later. Welcome to lecture 15 of modern construction materials. Today we are going to talk about polymers and polymer composites. I start off with this picture uh, from Australia on stairs, uh, walkway deck and grating made out of polymer composites. All that you see on this picture that is grey in colour is uh, polymer based. A traditional um, construction would probably be made out of wood and here we see a very nice use of uh, polymers and uh, these the flat parts are made out of planks of uh, fibre reinforced uh, polymers or filled polymers and uh, the darker grey on the right hand side picture here is grating again made out of polymer. Polymer materials are used extensively in construction in some structural applications, but many many more non structural applications. Maybe about 10 years back at least in India you would not see much application of polymers or plastics as they are commonly called, called in construction, but now you have roofing, partitions, wall cladding wall ceiling cladding other than doors and window shutters and frames, pipes and ducts, many applications in sealants, adhesives, admixtures, paints are also polymer based. Other than that we have repair systems and signage is very commonly done now with uh, polymers, we hardly see any painted sign boards anymore and floor finishing is going beyond the uh, use of tiles to polymer based floor finishes. So, we have a lot of applications of polymers in construction and we have to understand how these work, what are the limitations and where we could use the different polymers. Because again polymers is, is a large family, the polymer is a large family of products and we have to understand the properties of each of the different types in order to know where we can properly use them. Most of the development and this huge exploitation of polymers is due to the growth of the oil industry. Since the byproducts of the distillation of petroleum gives give the building blocks from which plastics are made. So, this is linked to the petroleum industry in a large extent. Here is the Mendeleev table where we have highlighted the typical elements used in polymers and you see that there are not many. The backbone or the framework element is normally carbon, in some cases you have silicon, other than that you have secondary elements which are hydrogen, oxygen and other elements. To some extent we have fluorine, chlorine, bromine also being used. So, the very few elements which make up polymers, however, we get a range of properties that we will see in the following like following slides. Common polymers, thermoplastic polymers are generally named after the monomer that makes up its backbone, we will look at some examples in a minute. The most common are those based on vinyl type monomers and you see the structure here. We have a backbone of carbon with CH2 in the chain and we can have two substitutional groups R1 and R2 and these vary giving the different properties of the thermoplastics. So, R1 and R2 are called the substitutional groups and these change from one polymer group to the other. So, here we have some thermoplastic polymers with a carbon backbone and on the first in the first column you have the different polymers and as we said the polymer takes its name from the monomer that forms the backbone and the composition of R1 and R2 for each of them is given here. So, for polyethylene we have hydrogen, in polypropylene we have hydrogen and CH3 as the substitutional groups, in PVC 
polyvinyl chloride which is something that is becoming very common in construction. We have everything from cladding to pipes made out of PVC, we have chlorine as one of the substitutional groups. In polystyrene we have hydrogen and C 6 H 5 as the substitutional groups. Polystyrene in the expanded form is used a lot for insulation and in some cases is filling material. Expanded polystyrene blocks are used to are embedded even in concrete to create a hollow space that is needed for decreasing the weight of the structural element or to provide insulation. Other than that we have uh, expanded polystyrene used directly in, uh, in places where we want to cut off heat, we want to ensure that heat does not go through. In PMMA polymethyl methacrylate the substitutional groups are CH3 and COO CH3, polymethyl methacrylate as you would know uh, also called plexiglass is a substitute for glass because it gives good transparency and it is also a hard stiff material. So, sometimes it is used in partitions and so on where we want some extent of transparency and we want a light material. Polymers having the same composition may different properties due to the differences in the characteristics of the st structure of the chain such as chain length and branching. So, even within this groups we can have differences and we will see um, some examples in the later slides. As we saw in, uh, in a previous lecture there are different types of polymer chains. The polymer chains can be linear or in the branched form and when the material is linear that it, it that is it has linear polymer chains there is a higher tendency for crystallization. And in the context of a polymer if you remember we said crystalline crystallization was when we had the chains all together. We had a rand instead of a random arrangement of chains we have the polymer chains all ordered together. So, there is a closer packing the packing is denser and this gives a higher transition temperature higher glass transition temperature and the strength is also more because now due to the closer packing we have better van der Waals bondings the van der Waals bonds are stronger and therefore, we have better properties in a linear material which is difficult to get in a branch polymer because the branches now interfere with this packing and an orderly structure is difficult to get. So, if we look at the example of polyethylene we see the advantage of this packing. When there is more packing more crystallinity we get higher density. So, a higher density polyethylene is used for making rigid pipes for hot water and so on and on the left we see stress strain diagram of both high density and low density polyethylenes. The top curve is that of high density polyethylene you see that you have a higher modulus of elasticity the stiffness is higher giving it more rigidity the strength is also high and after that we have a softening type response and a flat response. So, the, it loses some of its strength when afterwards you have a plastic response. Lower density polyethylene we are very familiar to it because we use it a lot for packaging and moisture barrier sheets in construction sometimes it is used at the bottom of a slab to cut moisture from going through or on top of a recently cast concrete uh, slab to prevent evaporation. How a linear density polyethylene would behave is shown in this dashed line and we see that there is a lower modulus of elasticity, the stiffness is lower, the strength obviously is much lower and afterwards we have a plastic response and finally, you have tearing or failure. So, this gives an idea of the effect of crystallinity which changes the density of the polymer how this would affect the stress strain behavior 
of the polymer. Thermoplastics as the name implies have variations in their properties as a function of the temperature. When the temperature is sufficiently high the thermal energy which has been put into the material overcomes the steric limitations and van der Waals bonds. Steric limitations are the entanglement that occurs between the chains or the physical hindrance that one chain poses to another which limits the movement and the separation of these chains. Other than that heat breaks or weakens the van der Waals bonds and therefore there is lot of mobility. The rotation now is possible between the individual chains, movement is possible in the individual chains as the temperature increases. This when we go back to uh, when we go back when we look at the what uh, what we covered in the lecture on the structure we understand that uh, there is and when there is an increase in temperature these bonds can break easily and separate and therefore the material becomes more of a fluid type material than a solid type material the flexibility of the chains and the mobility of the chain one chain with respect to another becomes more and more as the temperature increases the polymer starts behaving like a viscous liquid at higher temperatures. And if you remember when we talked about the covalent bond we saw why the polymer chain can have a lot of flexibility without the breakage of any of the covalent bonds because of the angularity or the directionality of the bonds the chains can rotate can move without the breaking of the covalent bonds and this gives rise to its flexibility. Generally polymers soften in the range of about 70 to 200 degrees and we will see later when we look at the glass transition temperature how the temperature where the polymers soften is quite low compared to other materials. So here we see uh, as a recap the effect of the temperature on the structure and to some extent the viscosity and the stiffness of the polymer. We have two te temperatures governing the behavior the melting temperature and the glass transition temperature above the melting temperature we have the polymer existing as a liquid the polymer chains are easy to move there is not much hindrance the heat energy is sufficient that the chains do not interfere with each other. Below the melting temperature if the temperature drop is slow enough and the chains are such that a crystalline solid can move can form such that the, a crystalline solid can form the movement of the chains is now hindered there is a packing of the chains the chains are closer to each other and we get a crystalline solid that is stiff and less flexible. If the chains are such that due to branching and so on we cannot have a crystalline solid forming or if the cooling is very fast an amorphous solid forms the structure does not change much from when it was a liquid and when it has become a solid the movement of the chains is allowed the movement of the chains occurs only under stress there is some amount of stress some force required to move the material it becomes very viscous and below the glass transition temperature this again the structure sort of freezes stays the same as before and however with the difference that only very small movements of the chains occur very small movement of the chains occur you do not have large chain, large movement of the chains. So we get a glassy solid below the glass transition temperature if we were going suppose we, if we were going the other way if we were increasing temperature here when we have an a glassy solid 
we will have little bit of flexibility the material is brittle and then when as we increase temperature the material becomes softer the material softens there is more movement possible between the chains and then above the melting temperature it becomes a liquid. The structure itself does not change much in the case of an amorphous material in the crystalline material we see a major change. So, as we said above the melting point the polymer behaves as a viscous liquid as the temperature is reduced we change slowly from a melt to a solid. The van der Waals forces hinder now the coiling of the chains they hold the chains together do not allow the chains to separate easily and the van der Waals forces the van der Waals forces also limit the mobility both of these lead to crystallinity in the linear polymers where we can get an orderly arranged packing. In this case the intermolecular bonding is maximized it becomes stronger and a rigid solid is obtained. When the chains are irregular in shape that is they get entangled they have branches which do not permit an orderly packing the structure does not change much from the viscous liquid to a solid and the structure remains amorphous that is without any crystallinity or order. The polymer becomes stiffer but not very rigid. Below the gla glass transition temperature the chain segments now lose all their mobility the structure becomes an amorphous solid it is however relatively brittle and rigid. In the case of substituents which are bulky and electrically charged we can get polymers with higher glass transition temperature. It is also interesting to note that when you have an amorphous structure there is a smaller volume change than when we have. It is interesting to note that when you have an amorphous structure we have a smaller volume change than we have when crystallization occurs that is there is less shrinkage going from a melt to a solid when there is an amorphous structure rather than crystallization occurring. And this is important because when we want to make the element of a certain shape and size we have to take into account the shrinkage that will occur when the material goes from the liquid to the solid form. And this gives what I have just explained. So, initially we have a liquid the volume of this liquid as cooling occurs is decreasing this again goes back to the Condon Morse diagram where we looked at how as temperature decreases the interatomic spacing decreases material will contract and this what occurs. So, as the temperature decreases the liquid is contracting at the melting point if the chains are such that the cooling rate is such that an amorphous structure or a glass structure is formed you see some change in the volume you first get an undercooled liquid until the glass transition temperature an amorphous structure which is retained in the solid form as a glassy structure there is some volume change but when you have a crystalline solid forming there is a much more significant change in the volume there is a more significant decrease here that we see and this is due to a stronger uh, van der Waals bonds more orderly structure a packed structure that is decreasing the volume of the solid. In these tables we find the different transition temperatures for different materials here we have the uh, vinyls with one substituent polyethylene, polypropylene, polyvinyl alcohol, PVC, polystyrene and so on and here you see the melting temperatures and the glass transition temperatures and you find that in some cases the glass transition temperature is minus 120 degrees or minus 27 degrees 
and this means that in normal temperatures we are above the glass transition temperature and we do not have a very stiff rigid solid like in the case of, of polypropylene or polyethylene. Vinyls with two substituents polyisoprene and PMMA some types of rubber all these will have uh, the melting temperature again quite low glass transition temperature very low in the case of polyisoprene 100 degrees Celsius in the case of polymethyl methacrylate. Teflon which is used as a solid lubricant we use Teflon to um, provide for some movement on supports Teflon sheets are used where, um, where you have some structural element resting on another and we want an interface that will allow movement as well as some plasticity you have you use Teflon and we have here Teflon with this structure having a melting temperature of 327 degrees it is a fully substituted vinyl. Other than that we have other materials polyamide, polyester, polycarbonate that we have shown here nylon is used a lot in textiles to some extent it is used in construction materials one example would be the use of nylon fibers to limit plastic shrinkage in concrete. Polyester also has been used to some extent in uh, fiber mats and fiber reinforcement uh, in concrete. Polycarbonates similar to polymethyl methacrylates have been used as substitutes for glass in partitions where you want a material that is light yet transparent and probably not as fragile as glass. So, we looked at the effect of temperature what happens to the stiffness as a function of the temperature. We have here curves for polymethyl methacrylate we find that such curves giving the change in the modulus of elasticity versus temperature can classify the polymers on the basis of their mechanical behavior. Here we see that at very low temperatures minus 40 degrees Celsius PMMA acts like a ideal elastic brittle solid it has a linear curve up to the peak and then there is suddenly failure. As temperature increases we have the material softening more we have a non-linear part and as we cross the glass transition temperature of 100 degrees in this case we have a peak occurring and even a post peak occurring without any brittle failure and we have a sort of a softening response and large amount of ductility lot of elongation that the material can undergo before it actually fails. So, we see a transition in the behavior from very brittle to softening plastic type response as the temperature increases in the same material. Different types of polymer structures respond in different way when we have uh, failure occurring and when the temperatures are different. In a viscous polymer when the temperature is above the glass transition temperature and we have an amorphous state before failure we have the chains entangled this is one reason why we cannot have a very crystalline structure because there is lot of entanglement there is hindrance cause between the chains at failure when there is an extensive deformation or stress these chains will uncoil stretch and slip against each other. So, this is the type of failure that we get we have a stretching of the material and we have flow of the material due to stress and deformation. In an elastomer we have a lightly cross link material again we are looking at temperatures above glass transition 
we have a similar structure to what I saw at what we saw before with some cross linking possible and when now these chains are stretched you have uncoiling and stretching of the chains, but not the slippage that we saw before where there is no connection between the chains the chains slip very freely one against the other this we do not see in the elastomer and when we release the stress we remove the stress we will have a large amount of recovery of the deformation in this case. In the glassy structure an amorphous structure, but now below the glass transition temperature we have a brittle solid material we have now the chains closer to each other again we do not have crystallinity we do not have an orderly packing and here the material when we have a lot of stress and strain will fail by cracking there is no deformation possible in the chains the chains are uh, fixed in their positions movement is restricted and the failure is through a crack. This is what would happen in the case of a polycarbonate or a polymethyl methacrylate. In a crystalline material we have now an orderly structure and we are below the melting uh, temperature we have the chains orderly packed and in this case we have failure occurring or excessive deformation occurring by separation of the blocks similar in some extent to how you will have shearing in a metal we have the blocks separating and we can have failure occurring like in this case an example would be high density polyethylene which would fail in this manner. So, what we see is depending on the structure of the polymer and the temperature that we are operating we can have different types of deformation and failure occurring as we impose stress and strain. So, this compares the different behaviors that we have discussed at the bottom we have a viscous material where we have very low resistance to stress lot of strain the material flows a lot. Next we have the elastomeric material where we have a large strain possible and when we release the load when we release the stress the material goes back the cross link pulls the material back to its original state. So, we have a non linear elastic system elastic still because it goes back to the original state does not retain does not stay with a large permanent deformation, but the stress strain uh, goes back to 0 when the stress is removed. An example of this is rubber that we will discuss with more detail in a minute. Then we have a rigid brittle material say in PMMA or polycarbonate we have a very high uh, linear regime very large linear regime strength is high failure is however brittle there is cracking brittle cracking sudden cracking and failure occurring. In, an, in other cases we would have say in polyethylene we would have some amount of linear behavior followed by non-linear behavior and a plastic or softening type behavior before failure occurs. So, even in thermoplastic polymers we can have a range of behaviors that can occur and we have to understand the chemical nature of the polymer to see in which category it will fit in. Now, there are polymers with functional groups these are groups that have molecules with a composition different from the monomer that forms the backbone chain. Generally these functional groups are more polar and more reactive than the basic monomer consequently they strengthen the van der Waals and hydrogen bonding and it can even lead to chemical bonding between the adjacent chains. So, it gives a stiffer and a stronger material than without. Some functional groups of this type give epoxies, polyurethane and polyesters. The nature and the density of the functional groups determines the properties of the polymer for example, in polyurethane we can have densely located urethane groups leading to very hard and strong polyurethane 
or it can be in a flexible form if the urethane groups are spaced apart. So, you can have a stiff strong polar polyurethane or you can have a more flexible polyurethane depending on the density of the urethane groups. We should also understand what are pre-polymers. Pre-polymers are non-cross-linked relatively short polymer chains having act active functional groups along their backbone. The pre-polymer is usually in a thin or thick liquid fluid state. The pre-polymer is usually in a thin or thick fluid state and the polymerization or the activation of the functional groups is obtained later by forming cross links and this leads consequently to hardening. This activation is obtained when you add a reactive component or when the material comes in contact with the atmosphere that is the presence of moisture and oxygen triggers the activation and hardening occurs. Now, this is very important in terms of construction or even everyday usage of some polymers in the sense that glues that we use the quick glues and two component glues or adhesives function this way. In the quick glues we have the activation by atmosphere one common material is cyanoacrylate which gets activated by exposure to atmosphere hardens and becomes adhesive and sticky. We can also have a reactive component we have many uh, resins and glues and adhesives where you mix two components activation of the pre polymer occurs and you have the cross links happening and a strong bond happening. So, as we said this is used a lot in polym fiber reinforced polymers adhesives and sealant and basically these materials are epoxies or polyesters. Some of these functional groups the polar functional groups for example, in epoxies are also effective in bonding to surfaces that are in contact not only within the material, but with the material that they are in contact with and this increases addition that is why they are used a lot in bonding of different types of materials almost all sorts of materials are bonded nowadays with polymers. Polymers are also combined with additives and fillers to obtain different properties needed for practical applications and some of these materials are listed here. Plasticizers are low molecular weight molecules that reduce the bonding between the polymer chains during fabrication. This also lowers the glass transition temperature and it is possible now to get the form or the thinness in the polymer for a certain application. Again for processing materials like lubricants are incorporated these reduce the external friction and improve the flow again facilitating the drawing or the extrusion of a polymer material. Stabilizers improve the durability. One of the problems of polymers is that they are not very durable when exposed to ultraviolet light and changes in temperature and humidity. Stabilizers are material which are introduced in the polymer to improve the durability, so that they can be used in external atmospheres, external environments. Other materials that could be incorporated in the polymer include fire retarders to inhibit the burning of the polymer, fillers which are inert substances they could be carbon black, uh, calcium carbonate even pieces of wood. So, that the mechanical properties are improved hardness abrasion resistance strength can change and these also lower the price of the polymer. So, the polymer can be used more easily in an application. <coughs> the 
there is also reinforcement possible in fibers in the next lecture we look at fiber reinforced polymers in uh, more detail as they are used in repair and strengthening fibers improve the ductility and the load carrying uh, load carrying capacity of the polymer carbon fibers glass fibers have been used extensively to reinforce polymers let us look at some engineering properties polymer materials generally have lower elastic moduli that is less stiffness than many other construction materials and they have a stronger viscoelastic response that is more creep or relaxation and this is something that you might have experienced a simple example is a rope that you might use for drying clothes when it is stretched and left by itself after a couple of months you will see that it has sagged because of the creep occurring in the material strain increases even at a small stress over a period of time especially when the temperature goes up the creep will be higher so this is something very typical of polymers that they have a high viscoelastic response that is not seen in many other construction materials the stiffness as we said is low the modulus of elasticity can be even less than 5 gigapascals exceptions are some crystalline polymers engineered to be very well packed such as kevlar which can be as stiff as steel but it can only be made in fibers and has limited applications due to this nature and also due to cost the higher viscoelasticity that we just mentioned in polymers is associated with relatively low transition temperatures and as we saw before as the as we go below the glass transition temperature the be material becomes solid but above that we have a material that has some amount of mobility in the microstructure and therefore it can undergo a lot of strain without offering much resistance or stiffness in terms of thermal and fire performance as we already saw polymers are very sensitive to changes in temperature they are therefore more prone to deformation and failure when there is excessive heat and and a fire than other construction materials the coefficient of thermal expansion is quite high 50 to 300 times 10 to power of minus 6 per degree celsius compared to 10 times 10 to power of minus 6 per degree celsius for steel and concrete so thermal coefficient of expansion or thermal expansion in polymers is generally high and we have to be careful of what happens in a polymer when there is a fire there could be degradation of the chemical uh, system and loss of bond breakage of bonds and this could lead to toxic toxicity of the fumes that are emitted and also a loss in the mechanical resistance that could lead to the failure of a structure if it is based on the strength that the polymer is offering we need to also worry about the weathering and durability of the polymers generally polymers are not attacked by chemicals and therefore they are extensively used for coating and reef surfacing components exposed to even aggressive environments this is the reason why we have a lot of floor finishes now coming up with polymers we have paints made out of polymers and several other coatings that are made out of polymers nevertheless polymers uh, some of them at least are sensitive to organic solvents they can dissolve when these substances are in contact with them due to the fact that the solvent can penetrate between the polymer chains and this penetration between the chains reduces the van der waals bonding causes the van der waals uh, causes the chains to separate leading to swelling and softening that is the stiffness decreases due to the increase in the distance between the polymer chains further as i mentioned earlier most polymers have problems when they are exposed to solar radiation the ultraviolet light and moisture and heat which can cause loss of strength embrittlement the material becomes more brittle 
consequently cracks and changes in appearance occur loss of color a whitening a bleaching appearance is taken by the polymer and this happens due to the following processes first photo degradation due to the absorbed solar radiation the ultraviolet light leads to the disassociation of the bonds the bonds become weaker due to the photo degradation then photo, photo oxidation can occur leaching of the plasticizer the plasticizer can uh, come out of the polymer we also have changes in dimension expansion and contraction due to the temperature and humidity cycling this eventually leads to cracking and crazing and this enhances the previous processes that we discussed as cracks occur the above processes are enhanced and occur faster with the ingress of moisture we can also have further swelling and leaching so we have to be careful when we use a polymer in an external environment to understand whether the polymer will survive in external conditions for a long period of time due to the solar radiation moisture and heat that it has to endure nevertheless there have been and there are a lot of exterior applications of polymers i'll show you some very nice examples on the left we have some polymer shutters partially transparent almost like glass giving an excellent aesthetic look uh, to uh, cafeteria in this case on the right we have the polymer planks and gratings that i mentioned in my uh, cover slide this would be the planks used like wood they can be drilled they can be cut as you would uh, timber plank and this has a thickness of about 1 to 2 cm then we have grating here also with a depth of about 1 or 2 uh, cm and this facilitates uh, water going through so there is no water stagnation and has sufficient stiffness that you can walk on it there are several other applications where uh, polymers have been used externally uh, this is a picture of a canopy or a roof made out of a tensile membrane of a polymer this is becoming very popular long back something like this could probably be done only with metal or uh, concrete but now we have external roofs canopies done extensively with tensile membranes we also have roofing sheets again a good alternative to asbestos which is being phased out and metal roofing we have uh, fiber reinforced polymer uh, roofing sheets which can be used like we would metal sheets and they can be transparent or opaque and with different colors we also have applications of polymers in housing where we can have very quick erection of small houses i believe that there are even houses made up to uh, two or three stories made out of uh, polymer walls and the roofing again could be polymer in this case they could be the walls could be a sandwich of polymer sheets on the interior and exterior and there could be a filler material a framing material that could be inside to provide insulation and stiffness we also have a lot of doors window shutters and frames being made out of uh, pvc and uh, other polymers this provides for a lightweight solution quick installation and lot of pleasing colors the range of options is increasing simple applications which are becoming very common signage for example at the bottom you see um, this structure made out of acp panels i mentioned acp panels when i talked about metals they are called aluminum composite panels where on the external face we have aluminum but the core is made out of a polymer here the lettering is also polymer based as the lettering in this case lighted and non lighted lettering so signage is going much beyond just painted signs and you have a wide range of shapes and sizes uh, and colors that we could get with polymers
Let us talk a little bit about elastomers. Elastomers are rubber like polymers, they have at least 100 percent elongation in a tensile test that is very high uh, elongation and a good ability to recover from the elastic deformation. Here we have the stress strain response of rubber strain to about more than 4 percent strain to more than strained to a value of more than 4 and when the stress is released we see that we go back to the original state. So, we have non-linear elastic response very large strains and then we can go back to 0. Some applications which benefit from such uh, behavior is in the use of neoprene, neoprene or chloroprene rubber has uh, carbon chains containing chlorine and these are used in supports of bridge girders. When we have the girders sitting on top of a bridge pier, we need some amount of mobility, there has to be some um, movement facilitated along the direction of the girder and some amount of rotation in the supports. So, neoprene pads which could be sandwiches with metal or solid neoprene is used a lot for the support of the bridge girders. Another type of elastomer that is used is polyurethane. We uh, saw before that if the urethane chains, urethane groups are sparsely populated that they are less dense, we have a lot of flexibility. Polyurethane can be used as a foam in uh, foam insulation in buildings to cut heat transfer through the wall. It is also used in varnishes, floor coverings. We have a lot of flooring now which is becoming very common based on polyurethanes and varnishes uh, coatings for wood are also being done with polyurethane. Silicones are other elastomers which again are used a lot in construction. These are inorganic polymers with silicon oxygen chain backbone instead of the carbon backbone. This is used as cocks say in wet areas in the bathroom to uh, avoid water from going through narrow openings coatings are being done with silicons and there are lot of sealants to uh, fill cracks and joints between different elements say in a uh, expansion joint in concrete construction or in glazing as a sealant between the different glass panels. This is an interesting application again from Australia where we see an exterior flooring being uh, done with chopped rubber tyres. Waste tyres have been chopped up, bonded together and made as flooring. This looks almost like asphalt, but it is made out of tyres. Here you see a close up on the right bottom and this gives some amount of bounciness, some amount of uh, flexibility in the pavement and if somebody falls on it, they would not get hurt that easily as in a rigid pavement and this is an application for waste materials instead of burning or throwing away tyres, this could be uh, an application for using such material. Finally, we will uh, talk a little bit about geosynthetics. Geosynthetics are materials which are polymer based and used in soil environment. Geotextiles are textiles used in soil they permit permeability, water can go through into the soil. So, there is no stagnation, there is a replenishment of the ground water. These are generally made out of synthetic fibers such as polyethylene, polypropylene, polyester and polyamide. So, these are open mesh like structures that hold the soil together and let water through. Geogrids are similar, but they are uh, more rigid, the spacing is more, it is an open mesh like polymer structure. Thermoplastic materials are used to have a composite system in conjunction with glass, this again reinforces the glass, this again reinforces the soil. Ge geogrids are, I said glass somewhere, geogrids are uh, mesh like polymer structures similar to geotextiles, but you have something more rigid open 
reinforcing the soil through a composite system. These grids can be cross laid strips or punch sheets that is a sheet with holes in it where the soil comes through or strips that are cross connected. So, those are called geo grids. Then we have geo membranes which can be used as lining sheets that make, uh, make a system impermeable to water. These sheets can be thermoplastic polymers or bituminous materials and they can be reinforced or unreinforced, reinforced to create more strengthening. Common applications are uh, pond liners, landfill liners and also under slabs on grade where we do not want water to go through from the soil into the structure. So, those are called geo membranes. Geo linear elements are long slender polymeric materials used as reinforcement of the soil and rock and these generally have unidirectional filament fiber cores. The fibers could be polyester, aramid or glass and this is in a polymer sheath of low density polyethylene or resin. So, this is like a reinforcement rod that helps soil and rock retain its integrity not to fall apart and get strengthened. Those are called geolinear elements. Geocomposites are any of the above combined in a fashion that it will help. So, two or more polymer systems combined into a hybrid is a geocomposite. For example, a drainage passage with a polymer core having a drainage channel and a geotextile skin as the filter. So, that would be a, an example of a geocomposite. And when we have uh, several applications in use on the, um, the we have geogrids that I mentioned, we can have uh, geotextiles in usage, liners of ponds and so on. So, there are many cases where geosynthetics have been used in construction. So, we will finish here with polymers. In the next lecture, we will talk about fiber reinforced uh, polymers. Here are some of the references. There are a lot of material available in the web also that you can find. So, we have looked at uh, different types of polymers, some of the important properties and as I said, we will look in the le next lecture at uh, on in the as I said, we will look in the next lecture into fiber reinforced polymers used in repair. This is a huge application that is developing lot of uh, research has been done and lot of applications have been made in that regard. Thank you.